welcome to In the Kitchen with Mary Mack. Well, here we are, late in March, and looking at uh, the Easter holiday coming up soon here in the United States and all over the rest of the world where you celebrate Easter. So we thought we'd do a podcast today on side dishes um, for your Easter dinner or brunch or lunch or whatever, and for also any other time you want to have a unique or different side dish that maybe you haven't tried before. So I have a collection of really good side dishes that I have tried and I really like a lot. And um, these all go nice with, um, if you're doing like a, a luncheon type meal that, um, well, let me put it this way. They all go well with ham. I guess it's easier to say that. <laughs> Uh, traditionally in the United States at Easter time, for some reason, we eat ham. None of us knows why that is, but that's just what we do. So these are all good with ham. They're also good with other things too. They're good with no meat at all, by the way. They're good just as standalones. I have had several of these as just the meal themselves. So I'm sure we'll hit upon that as we go along. The first one that we have you might hear some rustling in the background today because I'm moving a lot of the recipe papers around. So that's what that rustling noise is. And I'm trying to keep the mic in front of my face. So hope I don't go up and down too much in volume. So the first recipe is baked pineapple. We had this years and years ago at a family celebration of some sort. And we really liked it a lot. Nobody knew who made it. It was one of those deals, you know, nobody knew who made it. Nobody knew how to make it. Nobody knew what the recipe was. So we had a recipe that is not as good as this recipe that I found. This is a uh, baked pineapple and this is a very nice side dish, but actually it's good enough to be dessert. It's that good, but it also makes a very nice side for ham, especially. Here's the ingredients. You're going to need a fourth cup of butter melted, a fourth cup of all purpose flour, four eggs beaten, three-fourths cup of regular white sugar, one 20-ounce can of crushed pineapple in and with juice, and then you're going to need about a two-quart casserole dish. So you want to take that dish and coat it with butter, you know, like grease it with butter, you know, so things don't stick in it. Rub butter around in it. I don't know. Do whatever you do with butter to keep things from sticking in a dish. Do that thing. Okay. So you're going to get your casserole dish ready. Preheat the oven to 350 degrees, 175 degrees centigrade, which is on my, is that it? Centigrade? Celsius? Centigrade and Celsius are the same thing. Oh, thank God. I thought I was telling people some strange chemical temperature that would cause their dish to explode. So preheat the oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit or 175 degrees C. In a medium bowl... You're going to mix together the melted butter, the flour, the eggs, and the sugar so they form a sort of a batter, okay? And make them well blended. You don't want any lumps in there. You want to make sure your sugar is pretty well dissolved and distributed and your flour's the same. Stir in the crushed pineapple, juice and all. Pour this into your casserole dish, which you have securely buttered, and bake it in the oven for one hour uncovered. And this is pure heaven. It is absolutely delicious. The recipe instructions that I found say serve it warm, but actually it's good just about any way. So this is a really, really good, really good dish. Baked pineapple. Okay, moving along, our next recipe is something that my grandmother used to make uh, all the time. My grandma Fagan, and she was adept at taking nothing and making it into something delicious. I mean, she was just fantastic at that. She always had a very small garden behind her house, and she always grew peas in it. So we at least got this dish, creamed peas and new potatoes, once or twice while we were visiting. We, of course, had to pick the peas and remove them from the pod, and that took forever, but the payoff was this really good dish. Now, you can use frozen peas with this, don't panic, you know, if you don't want to uh, have to snap, uh, what do you call it when you take peas out of the pod? I don't know what that's called. Is that like shelling, shelling them? Shelling them. That's what it is, shelling them. I was going to say depod them or something. <laughs> yes, depod the peas. De the peas. I have a hard time remembering words and terms for some reason. It's probably my age, but I just can't remember words anymore. So I'm sorry. <laughs> words and terms escape me. So I just make up things. 
for example, I have an alcohol cupboard because obviously I can't remember the word for the other thing. So yeah, instead of a liquor cabinet, <laughs> we have an alcohol cupboard. <laughs> oh well. So this is the recipe for creamed peas and new potatoes. New potatoes, unfortunately, are no longer a thing in the grocery store. You don't, you just don't see them. You used to see them, you don't see them. And all they are is small potatoes. You very rarely even see small potatoes because now they're a treasure, apparently, and they sell them for a lot of money separately in a bag with other small potatoes. You used to get them in your regular potatoes and sort them out, but no more. So what you need is two pounds of small red or any type of potatoes. They call them fingerlings now. Usually if you see them in the grocery store, it'll say fingerling potatoes. And those are just really small potatoes that used to, um, nobody used to want them, but now everybody does. So two pounds of small potatoes. If you are using regular potatoes, you want to cut those up into small pieces with the skin on, maybe like inch and a half square, you know, like that. Two pounds of the potatoes. You're going to need two and a half to three cups of fresh shelled or frozen peas. So if you have peas, fine, or you want to buy peas and shell them, fine. If not, use frozen peas. And what you're going to do is take the, the potatoes. You're going to cook them in boiling water for about 10 minutes. And then at 10 minutes, you're going to drop the peas in with them and cook it for five more minutes and then drain that. Okay. So in the meantime, while that is cooking... You're going to take um, a fourth cup of butter, a fourth cup of flour, a teaspoon of salt, and a fourth teaspoon of pepper, and you're going to get a saucepan, melt the butter in there, you're going to add the salt and pepper to it, and add that fourth cup of flour, and stir that really well until it's well blended, and then gradually add two cups of milk to that. That's going to be your sauce. So you're going to take that sauce and stir that until it's well blended and cook it until it comes to a very low boil. You don't want it to burn or scorch, so you want to keep stirring that. Let it boil for like one to two minutes, and then once that's gotten thickened, you're going to pour that over your peas and potatoes, which you have drained and placed into a dish. You're going to pour that sauce over them and carefully blend them together, and it makes a delicious, absolutely delicious thing to eat. This is something you can just eat as a meal. It's sort of like peas and potatoes soup. But it makes a really good, it's, a, it's just so good. If you're going to use whole potatoes that aren't peeled in this, like I said, the small potatoes, you're going to want to poke those with a knife before you boil them. It, it kind of keeps them from, the skins from bursting on them. And that's the only extra tip I have there. But this is, just, this is a really good dish and a really good side dish. And it doesn't take too long to make. So I hope you give that one a try. I really, that's something I really, really love. Okay, next on our agenda is a couple of things that we make that my other grandmother used to make, Grandma Pellegrino. These are very simple, very, very simple things. One of them is something that my uh, mother-in-law made pretty often, my husband likes to make, and it's just a cucumber salad. This is a very nice side dish for just about anything. You're going to take about three to four cucumbers, peel them or not, if they have a nice um, skin on them. If they're from your garden and the skin isn't very heavy, don't peel them. If the skin's heavy, peel them. If they're grocery store, cucumbers, peel them. So you want about three to four cucumbers, not those whopper ones that have giant seeds in the middle, but smaller diameter cucumbers. And slice them in about one fourth inch thick slices into a bowl. And then one onion. And you're going to take that one onion and peel it and slice it into very thin slices into the bowl with the cucumbers and kind of break it up so it's in rings. And then you're going to just sprinkle sea salt, put a grind of pepper on top of that, and toss that with rice vinegar. Whichever kind of rice vinegar that you like, it can be the seasoned rice vinegar or the plain, and toss it. Let that sit in your refrigerator for about a half an hour before serving, and it is just delicious. It's just enough, very nice flavor. Okay, this is um, something also that my grandma did. My mother-in-law didn't do this one, but my grandmother did. Okay, this is a tomato salad with onions and wine vinegar. And this is fairly simple. You can use any kind of tomato in this, but I really prefer a sauce-type tomato that has a very thick, meaty tomato with very little water and seed inside of it. And that works really nice. And you want to take those tomatoes and cut them into small wedges. 
They can be, I wouldn't say quartered. I would say maybe try to get eight little wedges out of a tomato so they're not too big and put them into a bowl. And again, an onion, and you're going to take the onion and cut it into small wedges also so that you get like a lot of little strips of onion and sprinkle those out over the tomato. And then you're going to sprinkle a little bit of dried basil on top, maybe like a fourth to a half teaspoon of dried basil, some sea salt, no pepper on this one, and then you're going to get a good quality wine vinegar and just drizzle that over the top and then toss that and the same thing, let it set in the refrigerator for about a half an hour. It's, it's really good with fresh tomatoes in the summertime, but it's pretty good most of the time anyway. And one of the things we always liked was when the tomato juice would get mingled with the red wine vinegar and the, and the uh, basil and salt and that juice that's left, everybody wanted to drink it out of the bowl. It's also really good with bread, with a really good crusty Italian bread to dip into that juice. It's just delicious. But those make really nice side dishes too, and they're simple but flavorful. So that's something that's nice to put at your table, something that doesn't take you a lot of work but is has a very good flavor and looks beautiful on a table. My last side dish is another thing that my mother-in-law makes, and people ask her to make this all the time. I mean, it's this is like her... What do you call that? It's like her trophy side dish that she brings to everything. This is called country coleslaw. This is the ingredients. You need one head of cabbage, not too big, probably about a medium to large. Not You don't want a great big head of cabbage. So uh, one head of cabbage, one large green pepper, two medium onions, one medium-sized jar of pimentos, and one carrot what you're going to do, you're going to shred the cabbage. And that's done by if you split the cabbage in half and remove the core, you can then take the cabbage, put it on your cutting board and cut it in half. So you have quartered and then take those quarters and slice them as thinly as you can with a knife. I like this better than doing it in a food processor. You can use a food processor and it works okay, but this gives you a little bit bigger pieces of cabbage And this particular salad, it it marinades in it, and it actually is good with a little bit bigger cut of cabbage. Using a knife method is pretty good. But if you want to use a food processor, that's fine also. And just use the shredding attachment. Don't chop this. You just want it shredded. Next, green pepper. You want to clean it, cut it in half, and slice the halves into paper-thin slices. Very, very thin. Same with the onions. You want to slice them very, very thin into rings and separate the rings, or you can chop the onion. And then a carrot, you want to grate that with a larger size grate and grate the carrot. Mix those together into a large bowl. Now for the dressing. You need one cup of salad oil, I would say canola oil, one cup of sugar, white sugar, three-fourths cup of white vinegar, one and a half teaspoons of salt, one teaspoon of celery seed, and you put that in a pot and boil it for two minutes. Now what you're going to do is pour the hot dressing over the vegetables, put a lid on them, and put it in the refrigerator overnight. And that hot dressing is going to be absorbed by the vegetables. And then when you go to serve it, you want to stir that and toss it really well. If you have an excess of dressing on it, you can drain that off and then just serve that as your side dish. This is wonderful. This is a very good as a salad. It's good as the sort of coleslaw that you can put on a pulled pork sandwich or on a hot dog. It's just a very good coleslaw. So those are my side dishes. And here's one more bonus one. This is my favorite side dish from my childhood that a woman at our church used to make all the time. I make this, but I don't make it like she did. So I'm going to give you her recipe And then I'm going to tell you what I do instead. So this is Edith's mashed potatoes and spinach. It's kind of like a souffle. I don't know. I remember it from when I was little. I just loved this so much. And I didn't even like spinach. I probably didn't know what spinach was. I just figured it was good. So I ate it. Here we go. You need eight potatoes peeled and cooked and mashed. One package of frozen chopped spinach cooked. So you want to thaw that out. Chop it up a little finer and then heat that up. She has one stick of butter, a half pint of sour cream, which is a cup, I believe, a cup of sour cream, 
pepper to taste, five or six chopped green onions, and sharp cheddar cheese shredded, about eight ounces of sharp cheddar cheese shredded. So you're going to take all of the ingredients and add those into the mashed potatoes and put them into a casserole dish, which you have greased, and put it in the oven and bake it for about 30 minutes. And this thing is wonderful. This is wonderful. You can also put a little bit of cheese on top and make it look extra cheesy, but this is just a wonderful dish. Now what I do is I actually will make extra mashed potatoes to make this. So I get about six cups of mashed potatoes that have already been made, one package of frozen chopped spinach, and I thaw that, chop it up a little bit more, and heat it up. No butter, no sour cream, (laughs) salt and pepper to taste, and then I take the eight ounces of sharp cheddar cheese and just blend it all together. I don't put the green onions in also. So um, I blend it all together and put it into a dish and bake it in the oven. So mine is a little bit less calories, being as it doesn't have a stick of butter and a cup of sour cream in it, but still very good. So there you go. You've got now several new side dishes to try out to impress your family and friends with over the holidays or at your summertime picnics. These are also good. Those are These are all really good things to take to a potluck dinner or a picnic or anything like that. And I hope you'll try them out. And I hope you love these because I love these. These are all of my favorite side dishes. Be sure to check us out online on Facebook and Instagram at Mary Mac Bakehouse, on Twitter at Mary Mac Mixes, and on our website, MerryMacPodcast.com. This Monday evening, I'm doing a special cooking demonstration in Newcastle, Pennsylvania from 7 to 9 p.m. at First Assembly of God Fellowship Hall, 2021 Pulaski Road, Newcastle, PA. And it is from 7 to 9, and I'm going to do a cooking demonstration on um, pizzas. I'm going to make all different sorts of pizzas that I'm going to call gourmet pizzas, but it's actually just the kind of pizza that I like that has non-traditional toppings. So we're going to have all all different kinds of things I'm going to show you how to do, provide taste samples. And then we're going to, hopefully, if everything goes well, we're going to record a video and audio of this demonstration. So you'll be able to see that theoretically and hopefully on my website, merrymacpodcast.com. And I use my bread mixes for the crusts of the pizza. So um, if you want to try some of my bread mixes and make a really unique pizza with them, you can find those at my store on merrymacpodcast.com. I'm planning on doing a Reuben pizza with one of my rye breads as the crust. I'm going to do a dessert pizza with the oatmeal wheat germ bread as a crust, a fresh vegetable pizza with whole wheat crust, and several different things with my white bread mix, a poor man's pizza, and a thing that I call pepper pizza, I'm going to do that too. So if you're interested in doing some non-traditional pizzas, you're, you're going to find some really great bread mixes on my website that you can uh, purchase and use to make your crust with. So check those out. Thanks a lot for listening if you did, and if you didn't, too bad for you. <laughs>